Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're here with our esteemed guest, Dr. Emmanuel Navon. Um, I'm the West Coast Director of Friends of Elnet in Los Angeles. It's uh, 9 a.m. here, so good morning to our uh, West Coast members, and uh, good afternoon and good evening to everyone else around the world. And uh, Dr. Navon, thank you again for joining us. Um, you're a, a, a dear friend of Elnet. And uh, to anyone who's hearing from Dr. Navon the first time, he's Israel's leading international relations expert who lectures at Tel Aviv University, Reichman University, and at Israel's Military Academy. He is a fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security at the Kohelet Policy Forum and a foreign affairs analyst for I-24 News. His latest book is The Star and the Scepter, Diplomatic History of Israel, published by the Jewish Publication Society and University of Nebraska Press, which was also published in French in March of this year with the support of our organization, Elnet. So today we're gonna to talk about the impact of Israel's elections on its foreign relations and the Abraham Accords. And uh, there's so much going on, going on with regard to this topic, um, even over the weekend with new developments. So uh, Dr. Navon, do you wanna give a brief overview? Perhaps I, I think the logical step, the first step of um, this topic before we go into how it's going to affect Israel's foreign relations is, what new policies we can expect from this new government. And of course, that's going to stem from what uh, what new leaders are gonna be placed in new positions. And if you can give a brief overview and then we can get into how that could impact Israel's foreign affairs. Right, so first of all, uh, thank you again for uh, hosting me. It's always a pleasure to uh, to address uh, to address Elnet and um, I, I agree with you that um, it is really critical at this time to try and understand which kind of government Israel is going to have and how this is going to affect uh, Israel's foreign relations with regard to the Abraham Accords, but not only, of course, since LA deals with the relations between Israel and Europe. The question is also how is this new government going to affect uh, Israel's relations uh, with Europe? So as you know, uh, this uh, the last election that took place on November 1st is the first election that produced a majority uh, after four previous failed attempts. But the truth of the matter is that if you look at the result of the latest round of election, the fifth in a row within three years, indeed a majority emerged unlike in the previous four rows, but uh, there is for the prime minister, for the incoming prime minister, Netanyahu, he has a 53% uh, majority in parliament, in the Knesset, uh, meaning 64 seats out of uh, 120. But when you look at the popular vote, he barely got 50% of the vote. In other words, all the parties that support him for the job of prime minister, all those parties altogether, barely got 50% of the popular vote. So how come you have a discrepancy between the actual number of seats in the Knesset and the actual support of uh, voters uh, for Netanyahu? And the answer is it has to do with the, um, the threshold, the electoral threshold, because you need to, uh, you need to pass at least, uh, you need to gather at least 3.25% of votes of the popular vote in order to enter the Knesset. And this creates, as I said, a discrepancy kind of similar to the discrepancy you often have in the United States for the election for president, where you can win the popular vote, but then lose the election. So, of course, the reason here is completely different. Here, the reason is that two parties, uh, at least two parties in the bloc that opposes Netanyahu didn't pass the uh, electoral threshold of 325%. And this automatically... Uh, this automatically uh, uh, increased the number of seats for the pro-Netanyahu camp. So what I'm saying is that, on the one hand, I think it is a welcome outcome that we finally have a majority after four failed attempts to gather one. But on the other hand, 
let us know let us not have any new illusions on the actual size of this of this majority in other words Netanyahu and his supporters the the two orthodox parties and the far right uh, uh Otsmayudi party all together gathered barely 50 percent uh, of the uh, of the popular vote now Netanyahu in the past if you look at his record since he was first elected prime minister in 1996, uh, he's always tried to build uh, wide coalitions with centrist and even left-wing parties. That was always his strategy, especially when he came back to power in 2009. After a 10-year uh, gap, uh, he uh, lost power in 1999. He came back to power 10 years later. And if you look at his record between 2009 and uh, and uh, two months ago, basically, he always built a wide coalition with centrist parties because he knows that this is the best way for Israel to manage its foreign relations, uh, especially with the United States and with Europe. He's now uh, breaking his own uh, tradition by going full uh, speed with uh, the most uh, right-wing coalition in the history of Israel, and this goes against his own political instinct. But the reason why he's doing that is because um, he knows that only a coalition made up of his own Likud party, together with the two orthodox parties and the far right of Smayodi slash uh, Zionist, religious Zionist party, only such a coalition will be willing to promote legislation. Uh, that would uh, slow down or suspend uh, his trial. And that's basically the reason why he's going for it, even though inside himself, he happens to be very unhappy about this coalition because he knows the price that Israel is going to pay internationally. Every day when you open the news, when you read the news websites about Israel, uh, there is a new announcement about a radical member of Knesset being given a key post in the upcoming government, the last in, in uh, the last one being uh, the one person party called Noam, which is anti LGTB, anti reform, anti conservative Judaism, um, that basically only wants to recognize uh, Orthodox uh, conversions and weddings, that wants to uh, um, to change the law of return uh, to make sure that uh, only uh, Alachic Jews can uh, move to Israel. Uh, who wants to um, uh, to cancel all the legislation of civic equality for LGTB uh, couples, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. He's going to be given a, a key government ministry. Uh, then there is also Itamar Ben Gvir, uh, who um, you know a few years ago he was completely um, uh, off limits in Israeli politics. Uh, his mentor, uh, um, his mentor is Meir Kahana. Uh, he had a picture in his living room for many years of Baruch Goldstein. I'm talking about Itamar Benvir of Baruch Goldstein, who murdered Muslims in prayer uh, in Hebron in 1994. He's been arrested many times by the police, uh, and he's been convicted many times for uh, uh, racism and incitement. Uh, when his mentor, Meir Ka'ana, was member of Knesset in the late 1980s, the prime minister of the time, Yitzhak Shamir, from Likud, would uh, make a point of walking out of the Knesset to boycott Meir Kahana. Uh, Forty years later, his, uh, uh, his admirer and student, Itamar Ben Gvir, is going to be a senior uh, member of the government. He's going to be in charge of the police, the same police that has arrested him and interrogated him many times. He's going to be giving orders to the police um and so on and so on so it's um it, it's indeed uh worrying i would say for uh for israel and the question is what are going to be the consequences well first of all we know already uh, that the united states has basically uh, uh blocked the appointment uh, as defense minister of betzalel smotrich uh who's the uh, leader of the uh religious Zionist party and who's going to be a minister of uh, finance. Um, but we don't know yet who is going to be foreign minister. What we do know 
is that the uh, criterion for Netanyahu to promote people in senior positions, such as the foreign ministry, is only their faithfulness to Netanyahu and not their qualifications. So the names that are going around at this point are um, Ron Dermer, uh, who was for about eight years ambassador to the United States. But as we know, uh, it would have a, a very hard time dealing with a democratic administration in America. He was basically blacklisted during the Obama administration uh, in Washington. Another name is Amir Ohana, uh, which has who has absolutely zero experience in foreign policy, no knowledge of diplomacy, uh, and not even talking about his English. But again, he's very, very faithful to Netanyahu. Regardless of who is appointed foreign minister, uh, the foreign policy of Israel will be conducted by Netanyahu himself. He did this in the past also. The, the pattern of Netanyahu when it comes to foreign policy will repeat itself, and that means that he will undermine the foreign ministry. He perceived Israel's foreign ministry as a hostile uh, group of diplomats who try to undermine his policy. So as foreign minister and, um, and prime minister in the past, He's always undermined and uh, dried out the budgets of the foreign ministry and conducted Israel's foreign policy basically directly with the national security advisor. This is what he's going to uh, be doing in his upcoming uh, administration, and therefore it doesn't really matter who is going to be a uh, foreign minister. Um, it, it matters what Netanyahu is going to do as prime minister and how he's going to handle Israel's foreign policy. He's, he's aware of the fact that his coalition is going to be a very hot sell in Europe and in the United States, though not in Russia and China for obvious reasons. But when it comes to Europe, to the United States and to the Arab countries that have normalized their relations with Israel, Netanyahu knows that this coalition is going to be a very hot sell. Um, how is he going to handle it? So we know, and he said it also during the uh, election campaign, he repeated it after his electoral victory a month ago. We know that he wants to expand the Abraham Accords. Uh, he's the one who signed them uh, under the Trump administration. He would like to uh, uh, expand them to Saudi Arabia, probably Oman. The question is, would he be able to do so with such a coalition? When we know that key members of this coalition, such as Itamar ben -Gvir, and Bezalel Smotrich have expressed themselves very clearly in the past that they want to annex all of the West Bank, all of Judea and Samaria, but without granting rights and citizenship to the Palestinians. In other words, I myself, like many pro-Israel advocates, fight very hard against the uh, false accusation of apartheid leveled at Israel. But the truth of the matter is that what Bezalel Smotrich and Itamar ben -Gvir want to implement is apartheid because they want to apply Israeli law on all of Judea and Samaria, but without granting citizenship to its Arab inhabitants. Uh, now, of course, Netanyahu will not let this happen. However, let us not forget that the condition of the United Arab Emirates in the summer of 2020 to normalize their relation with Israel was a clear commitment by Netanyahu to suspend indefinitely the annexation project of the West Bank, which was part of his election campaign in 2020. Netanyahu agreed to that. This clause is written black uh, and white uh, in the agreement, in the normalization agreement with the UAE. This was also the understanding with Bahrain Saudi Arabia would never have given its uh, blessing uh, to these agreements if Israel had not committed to suspend indefinitely its annexation plans. True, in Netanyahu's plan, the, the idea was not, of course, to annex all of Judea and Samaria, but, also, but only the, uh, the parts of it that were uh, attributed to Israel, according to the deal of the century of Donald Trump and his, and his son-in-law, Jared Kirshner, mostly uh, the Jordan Valley. But again, there is a commitment here not to proceed with such an annexation. Now, there are going to be calls by Smotrich and by uh, Ben Gvir to proceed with annexation. 
they couldn't care less about the relations with the United Arab Emirates and with Bahrain. Uh, we would have also a problem with Morocco. Of course, Morocco also opposes any type of annexation by Israel. So Netanyahu will have a problem because he obviously understands uh, foreign relations. Uh, he's the probably the most knowledgeable Israeli statesman about Israel's foreign relations. And he knows exactly which diplomatic price is well Israel would pay at this point when it comes to the Abraham Accords and to the normalization agreements with Morocco, if he were to proceed even very partially with uh, an, annex an annexion uh, plan. So my guess is that at least for the first year of his administration, he will resist calls from the far right in his government to proceed uh, with annexation. So I don't believe that he will be able to expand the Abraham Accords because I do not see how Saudi Arabia at this point would normalize its relations with Israel. It didn't do so for the past year and a half when Israel had a centrist government which was interested in such normalization. And the reason why Saudi Arabia didn't proceed, I mean, there are a few reasons, uh, but basically, first of all, the Saudis were waiting to see what would be the policy of the Biden administration on the nuclear deal with Iran. And as long as there was, uh, it was unclear what the US policy would be, the Saudis didn't want to make to take any step in that direction. Then, of course, there was the war in Ukraine and the American request from Saudi Arabia to increase its oil production in order to lower the prices of oil. As we know, this request was rebuffed by the Saudi ruling family. So I do not see at this point which incentive the Saudis would have to normalize their relations with Israel and which leverage the Americans would have on them to convince uh, MBS uh, to proceed and to overcome his father's reticence to uh, normalize relations with Israel. I think Oman wouldn't make a decision without the backing of Saudi Arabia. And if you add on top of that, uh, the makeup of the upcoming government, I really do not see how Netanyahu would pull out a normalization with Oman and with Saudi Arabia with such a government and in such a context. Uh, I do not think that the upcoming government uh, the upcoming coalition uh, would undo or undermine the Abraham Accords, uh, the leaders and the diplomats of the UAE, of Morocco and of Bahrain have already made it clear that as far as they're concerned, they made a final and long-term decision and they don't wish to uh, meddle within Israeli uh, politics. Of course, if there are provocations, uh, if there's violence with the Palestinians, and if Itamar ben overreacts, that might create tension and problems. But other than that, they've already clarified that as far as they're concerned, they've made a final and long-term decision that will not be affected by the makeup of Israel's uh, upcoming government, no matter how far on the right uh, it is. But when it comes to Europe, on the other hand, we do have a problem because um, Israel, Israel's foreign policy, traditionally has always been to boycott uh, European political parties, which it deems uh, off limits in terms of the politics on the far right. Uh, now, uh, this was the policy and still is the policy uh, with the National Front in France, for example, with the AfD in Germany. It will be uh, nearly impossible for Israel to maintain this policy with Itamar ben in its own coalition, because compared to the AfD in Germany, or, I mean, let's put it that way, compared to Ben Gvir, the IFD in Germany and the national rally in France are moderates. So it will be nearly impossible for Israel's foreign, foreign policy establishment, the Israel's government, to keep that stance on far right political parties in Europe when the Israeli government itself will have a far right party in its own uh, coalition. Now, it would be tempting for Netanyahu in such a context to focus Israel's relations in Europe only with governments that also have far-right parties in their coalition uh, or that have a policy that undermines the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary and of the media, such as Poland and Hungary, and which have a, a very conservative, very right-wing governments such as Italy and now Sweden. Uh, he might do that. He might... Uh, uh, focus only exclusive, almost exclusively 
now on Poland, Hungary, uh, Italy, and, and Sweden, and maybe hope for other European countries to also elect uh, far-right governments. Uh, but of course, even if he does so, uh, Israel main, Israel's main trade partner is the European Union. And the European Union cannot be ignored. Uh, Germany uh, is a key uh, defense partner of Israel. France is also a very important partner. It has a veto power at the Security Council. So does Britain, which is not part of the EU. And therefore, ignoring all of Europe, except for four countries with far-right governments, would be, in my opinion, a mistake. But whatever he does, it's, uh, it's not our situation right now. It's not Houston. We have a problem. It's Paris, London, Berlin, and the rest, we have a problem. And this is why, in that context, uh, the role of Elnet is going to be even more important and critical because with a weakened, uh, dried out foreign ministry, uh, with a foreign policy that is going to be dismissive of Europe, especially if he appoints uh, Ron Dermer. Uh, for Ron Dermer, there's uh, the United States and nothing else. And even in the United States, only the Republican Party is extremely dismissive of Europe. And so uh, we will have Elnet in such a context will have a critical role to play. Again, regardless of what Netanyahu's policy is going to be in Europe, he might try to actually maintain and even improve ties uh, with uh, Western Europe, with the main players in the EU and with the United Kingdom. But Israel will have a very, very hard time and will need, uh, the foreign ministry will definitely need the support uh, of, uh, of Elnet uh, to uh, maintain and improve its relations with with Europe, and if Netanyahu decides uh, to basically ignore the EU and only focus on Poland, Hungary, and Italy, then even more so, uh, the role of Elnet will be critical to maintain and improve relations uh, with those countries. So as we're speaking, as I'm speaking, if you had asked me two or three weeks ago, it was still unclear whether Netanyahu would actually go for this far-right coalition or if he would choose to form a government with centrist parties, as he always did in the past. As we're talking today on the 28th of November, uh, 27 days after our election, it seems nearly 100% clear that he is going for this far-right coalition of 64 MKs. Um, I, as I said, to summarize, and then I'll take your questions, I do not think that such a coalition uh, would undermine uh, the uh, normalization agreements with the Arab world, unless, of course, there are outrageous statements from Smotrich and Ben Gvir, and unless uh, there is uncontrolled violence uh, in the West Bank and uh, repression that would be uh, perceived as unacceptable in Morocco and in, in the UAE. But I do not see how with such a coalition and in the current geopolitical context in the Middle East, Netanyahu would be able to expand the Abraham Accords. And when it comes to Europe, as I said, we are going to have a very big problem with Europe, and therefore we're going to have a very big need uh, for an active and expanding LNET in the coming years. So um, I'll, uh, I think I answered your question, and I'll, you know, I'll be happy to, to take more questions. Excellent, excellent overview of the challenges facing Israel in the context of the new coalition government. And um, you actually answered some of the questions that I had. One, and I'm going to uh, encourage our participants, our audience, to send questions to Elnet Q and A on the chat box. And I'm going to kick it off with a couple questions of my own. Um, the maritime agreement with Lebanon, facilitated by France, um, I believe Netanyahu and his allies had. Uh, on many occasions denounced the agreement as a surrender of sovereign um, um, territory, uh, territorial waters, I should say, and potential nas uh, national resources in the form of natural gas fields. Um, but now that they're in power, uh, could that be impacted? Could this agreement be impacted by the new government? And it affects Europe in more than one way. I think uh, for one, it was facilitated by France, and two, Europe is actually in need of uh, diversified energy needs, given the uh, uh, Russian ongoing war on Ukraine and, and the energy crisis facing Europe. 
So what is your assessment on that? So the, the short answer to your question is that Netanyahu is not going to change a single letter in this agreement. The longer, the longer answer is why. So first of all, don't forget that what politicians say when they're campaigning is what politicians say when they're campaigning. There's a difference between being an elected prime minister and somebody running for office. It's two different worlds. Uh, he knew when he said what he said during the campaign that he didn't mean a word of what he said. He knows that this agreement is excellent for Israel. He was just campaigning, trying to uh, depict this agreement as a capitulation that was unacceptable. Uh, I was uh, an hour ago uh, at Tel Aviv University. Uh, I was hosting in my class uh, the French ambassador to Israel, Eric Danon. Uh, he was personally involved in negotiating this agreement. He said himself, I know exactly what Netanyahu said during the campaign, I'm telling you, so I'm, I can quote him even though it was of the record, that he knows and he said in private that this is an excellent agreement for Israel. He's not going to change a single letter in this agreement. And the reason for that is that the, uh, this agreement, first, first of all, let us not forget that this agreement was signed between the Middle East's greatest power, Israel, and the Middle East's worst failed state, Lebanon. There's nothing to compare. There's no, it's completely unreasonable to talk about a surrender when you are the great power and on the other side, you have a failed state that doesn't have electricity and running water for its population, uh, whose government cannot pay the salaries of its uh, employees, and whose central bank came up with a Ponzi scheme, okay? Uh, and who's basically run by a, a terrorist militia, Hezbollah, whose arsenal is bigger than that of the uh, 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 Lebanese army and is controlled by Tehran. So of course, Israel is negotiated in a position of force because it is a great power and Lebanon is a failed state. Now, this agreement enables Israel to immediately exploit its natural gas resources in the north and expand its status as a natural gas power, as an energy power, when such resources are in huge demand because Europe is, faces, is facing an energy crisis. And one of the reasons why Europe and the US pressured Israel and Lebanon into signing this agreement is because they're desperate for our gas. They're freezing out in Europe. Uh, of course, Israel by itself, even in its partnership with Cyprus, cannot replace Russia. However, Israel, together with Cyprus and Egypt, constitutes a huge uh, exporter of natural gas for Europe. And that is the reason why the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, was in Israel in June to sign an agreement for the uh, supply of natural gas from Israel to the European Union. So with this extra gas field that Israel can now exploit thanks to its agreement with Lebanon, Israel is becoming a very significant player in natural gas when this resource is very much in demand, especially in a Europe that is at war and in which Russia is now cutting out all its natural gas exports to the European Union. Now, when it comes to Lebanon, yes, uh, the agreement gives Lebanon access to also, in it, what is now considered its territorial water, uh, waters, a very uh, important uh, gas field, except nobody knows what's in it. It might be completely empty. So we know that ours is full because we've already done the, the studies. And so Israel already started uh, exploiting this field and selling its natural gas. Lebanon might have natural gas, but we don't know because they never did. They never checked it out. And let me tell you, they're never going to do it or they might, it may take a long time because as I said, they already have a French company looking into it. But again, we're talking about a failed state. So, you know, we all wish them good luck, but I, I, I wouldn't expect them to, uh, uh, to export this natural gas anytime soon. You know, they had this huge explosion in their in the harbor of Beirut four years ago, they haven't even started to fix it. So, you know, when they start fixing the harbor, maybe they'll be able to export uh, natural gas, but they're not even there yet. So uh, Israel did not capitulate. Israel got an excellent deal. Everybody knows it, including Netanyahu. Excellent, thank you. So um, 
we have a question from Yossi Lemkovich. Uh, Yossi, do you want to unmute yourself and ask about this topic? Yes, thank you. Um, my Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, because of what you mentioned about uh, Israel's relations with, uh, uh, with the rest of the world, uh, don't you think that this coalition will more concentrate on internal issues like security in the country, where, you know, uh, fight against ter terror, all these issues, also the religious uh, part of the coalition, so more concentrate on internal issues than on foreign policy? Well, even if they wanted to, you can never run away from foreign policy. It's always part of the reality and the two are related. If let's say Ben Gvir decides to uh, use a very tough policy against uh, Palestinian terrorism and change the rules of engagement uh, against Arabs in Israel, obviously there will be immediately impacts on Israel's foreign relations because we are in the aid of the internet. Whatever happens is immediately reported on Twitter, on Facebook, on all the social media. And any, any violent reaction to a wave of Palestinian violence by uh, the upcoming Israeli government would immediately impact on Israel's foreign relations with the Arab countries, with Europe, with the United States. And no matter how the upcoming administration will wish to focus on domestic matters, uh, it will not be able to disconnect this from Israel's uh, foreign relations. Same thing when it comes to the status of women, to the religious status quo, uh, it will impact on our relation with American Jewry. And that is also very important for our relation with the United States. When you have members of the upcoming government, including Avi Ma Ma Mao from the, uh, from the uh, Noam party, who says he wants to cancel, to repeal the mixed uh, uh, area at the Kotel, at the uh, Western Wall, which was designated for non-Orthodox prayer. He wants to shut it down. He wants to end the recognition of... Um, non-Orthodox conversions and weddings. Imagine this can be considered um, domestic issues, but obviously it will have an immediate impact on Israel's relation with the biggest Jewish diaspora in the world, in the United States. And that will impact also on our relation with the United States. So as I said, no matter how much this government, this upcoming government will decide to focus on domestic matters, it will, impos it will be impossible to disconnect it from Israel's foreign relations. 